Cabo West was was chosen as a target because of what Cabo West was, which was a slaughterhouse that was killing up to 500 horses a week. It was a horrible, evil place. The plan was that we needed to, we had to destroy the infrastructure, and that's what what we did. Uh, where did you serve time? I served time in Phoenix, Arizona at the Medium Federal, uh, they call them FCIs, Federal Correction Institution, so it was a medium level. My sentence was um, 51 months. I mean, I think whenever I'm doing any, any actions, whether it's any animal liberation actions, it's, to me, even though you may be saving a particular animal, there's always a bigger picture involved with the whole thing. I always feel like that if you're a person that is going to have the heart to go out and defend an individual animal, how can you not have the heart to see the whole picture of what's really going on in this world when you have, we're in the sixth mass extinction right now. We've got ecosystems collapsing everywhere, um, species dying out. And animal liberation is tied to that directly. I could say that there's probably some people that may be just animal centric, but I've never been that way. We did a recon on the University of Oregon for, for months, for six months. And I'd been in the labs myself, in and out. We had access and we knew everything about that place. They were doing research on pregnant cats, opening them up, taking the babies out blinding them, either sewing their eyes shut, one eye, both eyes. And they were doing these same tests for years and years, which really meant nothing except that the, the university was getting half a million dollars each year from National Institutes of Health and other grants. So it was a big money-making thing. It was, it was, despite the fact of what you think about or feel about vivisection or animals and research, this research had not, there was nothing behind it at all. And we got in at night and we did it in about three or four hours. We did the whole thing. We released almost 300 animals. Cats, uh, mice, rabbits, and monkeys. And um, we couldn't get the monkeys out because we had no homes for the monkeys, which was really sad. We wanted to get them out. Also, I also had no experience in handling monkeys too. They were rhesus monkeys from what I recall, but I did bring in a bunch of bananas for them. <laughs> you know. I, at least I could do something for him when I went in. I was, and the only thing I did with around the monkeys was that I personally destroyed the stereotactic device. I actually bought the little sledgehammer, especially for that, because I had seen that device forever and I kept eyeballing it. I was like, I'm gonna destroy that device because it is a very horrible device. That was my first action. I'd never done one like that before. And uh, it was a rush. I mean, it was the, the, to be able to take be able to take an animal out of a cage and give it a home was just a really good, a really good feeling. There were always actions happening after the Oregon action. It continued on from everything from small actions to larger liberations. It just, you know, that was my life. That was everything I strive for. I had a part-time job, did my work to make my money to pay my rent, and everything else was about animal liberation. The thing that was interesting was a lot of the people that I was hanging around with were very smart people who were very educated and I listened and learned from them and I started understanding what was really going on and understanding more about ecosystems and, and how important things were and this and that and as I started to understand that I started putting it all together like a puzzle. I was able to complete the puzzle and I saw this very, this very um, dark world that I was that to me was very, it was very disturbing. And uh, I, I, <laughs> sorry. I think that, uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> excuse me. There's a despair that we all hold in, in us. I, I can't do this.
No, I'm good. I'll keep going. I'm good. Um, I think I think for me, for myself, I can say that um, somewhere I tend to channel the suffering and the pain and the destruction in me. It's a uh, you know, it's a pretty intense experience to to always have that in you. It's it's something that um, I always say that in a lot of ways I prefer to be aware and be in touch with my despair than to be to be unaware and not in touch with what's going on. And I don't want to live in bliss. I want to live in reality. And a lot of times the reality that's going on is is um, it's it's very disturbing and scary and so the only way I could channel that is to do something about it it was hard for me to discuss anything even with the closest person in the world to me my wife Tammy because I had such a habit of never discussing this stuff ever it was just I just didn't talk no one knew about people closest to me no one knew maybe people suspected things about me but I didn't talk to anyone about it. No one knew anything. So I didn't share with my wife anything about my illegal past. Um, so when things started falling apart, um, she didn't, I still did not admit that I was involved in anything until the FBI came and arrested me. And then it was clear, obviously. Um, I was here at home, actually. My wife was in Seattle visiting her daughter and it was a blizzard outside at the time because it was in January and uh, I uh, went to plow the road but before I plowed it I decided I was going to go up and get lunch up at the local restaurant in town and uh, I went up there and the FBI were at the end of my road and they followed me. I saw two cars parked there. I didn't really think much of it um, and I just drove to the restaurant and when I walked in to make my order, I walked inside, a guy approached me and flashed his badge. And right then I knew that was it. And he goes, do you want to step outside? And I go, okay. I knew. I was prepared for it. I knew it was happening. I knew I was pretty much prepared that it was going to happen someday. There was a part of me that was hoping it wouldn't. So there, I was, there was a part of me that was in denial about the whole thing. But, you know, the, the realistic side of it all, I, I knew in reality that, you know, they were going to come and get me. I just didn't know when. I was in solitary confinement for a week because while they're getting through your paperwork and or whatever, make sure you're not bringing drugs in for whatever reason, I was in for a week in the hole, um, which, which was not fun because it's the hole. But after I got out of there, I was transferred to a unit. And usually because prison is so, um, uh, it's so race-based there. The races are always separated. Um, the first thing when I walk in, all these white guys, they come up to you and they give you your shower shoes and they give you soap and everyone supplies you up with what you need until you are able to get your own property um, or get to the store and get your own stuff. So usually that's how it is. You get set up and you get selled up and you just sort of try and figure out how to go around things get around the place and um, but then when I got home when I finally got home and was back here it was definitely at first it was definitely a, a, a shock just almost not only emotionally but visually because of being in prison and the sterile atmosphere and all the concrete and everything was hard and you know it was just there was no carpeting anywhere was none, none of this stuff you know plastic chairs and then I come back to my home with you know, comfortable chairs and beautiful view and, you know, it was definitely a change, you know, um, but it didn't take long where prison just started going away, just started flying away <laughs> from me. I just kept going forward, you know. There were times in my life that I felt like I needed to take a time, some time off for myself to actually be selfish for once in, for once in my life not as selfless as I had been and I did that but it didn't take long before I realized I had to get back into being an activist because it was you know there was this I just felt like I had to just keep doing things and that's part of being an activist is like not stopping. Uh, 
On this planet itself, without humans, the animals and the environment would thrive. The populations would get healthy, things would really change. But without animals, humans would die. We can't live without the animals out there. So in a lot of ways, animal rights is a human issue. It's all, it is you are helping humans by defending animals. Now a lot of people don't see that because they don't understand that connection. But there is a deeper connection because of the intricate connection that life has that keeps life in that, as they, some people call it, the circle of life. The, you know, what keeps biodiversity alive is every single creature, every single plant, everything on this planet has a, has a place. So by protecting those things, you're protecting humans. Thank you.